currently live in um, Philadelphia. And Philly people? I love you. I love you. That's so exciting. Okay, so I'm from Philly. I'm sadly though, um, I'm moving um, in a few weeks to Maryland. Any Maryland? Nice, okay. I'm moving to Maryland um, for a new job at uh, Mount DeSales Academy. Um, this all-girls Catholic high school, I'll be a campus minister there. Word up, I'm pretty stoked about it. So um, in my last few weeks of living in Philly, there are certain things that I want to do while I'm there before I leave, right? Um, I have a bucket list. Does anybody here have a bucket list? Nice. I love the love that I'm feeling right now because um, usually people make fun of me. Thank you. <laughs> awkward. <laughs> Does anybody know how to do the awkward turtle? Anyone? Yep, thank, yep, right there. I don't really get it. It doesn't really make any sense. It's just awkward, right? So anytime you feel awkward, just do the, do the turtle. All right, all you pee pants people out there, the people that admitted to peeing their pants. <laughs> awkward, right? No, not for you. You're not awkward right now. All right. So, um, so one of the things on my bucket list, so if, for those of you who don't know what a bucket list is, it's a list of buckets. <laughs> Just kidding. It's a list of things that you want to do before you die, okay? Or you can have a bucket list for high school, things, a list of things that you want to do before you graduate high school, right? So I have a list of 100 things that I would like to do, and some of them I've checked off. It's pretty cool, right? Some of them are silly. Some of them are like actual goals, right? This past... June, um, one of the, I think it actually was one, number one on my list, maybe number two, um, was to hike this crazy, insane mountain in California called Half Dome. Anyone? No? Okay. It's, it's, a lot of people don't know about it, but basically when I say Half Dome, I'm not, I'm not lying, okay? It's a, it's a dome. It's a half a dome, all right? And you look at it and you're like, I am going to die. Why am I going to voluntarily climb up this mountain? It's a 20-mile hike, all right? So you go 10 miles up, and then there's these cables, and you, you're going up the cables, and it's like vertical. You're like one with the mountain, right? Um, you get up. It's amazing. And then you come back down, and then you die, right? Um, it's, it's amazing. Anyway, so I checked that off, right? Pretty cool. Um, <laughs> pee, pee my pants. You bet five bucks. He's like, pee your pants. Put that on your bucket list. That is not on my bucket list. I will not pee my pants. Jeez. Okay. One of the things is to drive a really fancy car. Go test drive a really fancy car. I think that'd be kind of cool, right? I'm not like a car connoisseur, right? I don't really know much about them. But I just think it'd be neat. I think maybe it might be a little more frightening, actually, than climbing Half Dome, because Half Dome is not $300,000. <laughs> um, so, well, whatever. You can't really buy a mountain. Anyway, besides the point. Um, so in Philly, there's this really nice Ferrari dealership, like a minute from where I live. It doesn't make any sense, because I'm not rich. But... Um, I really think I need to do this before I go to Maryland. So this is a true story. I called up the Ferrari dealership. I'm such a weirdo. Father, you're not the only weirdo. I'm a weirdo too. Um, I called up the Ferrari dealership and put on my best, most distinguished, rich person voice and asked if I could test drive the, this one specific Ferrari that they've had on display for like a month now. And every time, because the display windows, it's like, all windows, right? So when you drive by, you're just like, whew, here I am in my little 91 Camry, rocking it, right? And um, I asked if I could drive if that car was able to be test driven. And it made for a very interesting conversation because I probably was like the 50th caller of the day, like trying to test drive their car. And she's like, you think you can just come on to this property and just test drive a $300,000 car, you know? But I didn't realize, I guess, 
I, as I went on in the conversation, I realized maybe it would be a lie if I went to this car dealership and was like, yes, I'm very seriously considering this car. Um, so I kind of let it go. But one of the things she said to me was, well, that car, you can't test drive that car anyway because it doesn't have an engine. So that car's just on display. There's no engine in that car. And I was like, what is the point of that car, right? What's the point of a car without an engine? And then I kind of reflected on myself and on the culture and how the culture is obsessed with the fancy car but no engine. Like, am I just a fancy car, but I don't really know what's going on inside of me? What is fueling me? What is driving me? What is the purpose of my existence as a person? Is it to put on this fancy car facade for the whole world? Is that, is that where all of my focus is? Because that's what the culture is telling me, right? Facebook is a perfect outlet to put on a mask. I'm not, I'm not demonizing Facebook, okay? I just got back on after many years of being off. I'm, I, I don't, I'm not demonizing. I think it's a good tool for a lot of good things. But it can be used as, as a means of putting on a mask, putting on a layer. Here I am. Here's all my best moments. Look at me like this. And then we put our identity in our Facebook and in what the world is seeing of us and who is liking us because we're so desperate to be seen and to be known, but we're going to the all, all the wrong places to find that fulfillment. Our culture is obsessed with putting on that mask, putting on that facade. Maybe if I put a facade on Facebook of myself, I can deceive others that I'm fine that I don't need anything, I don't need God, maybe I can deceive myself. Maybe I'll just go numb. Oh, that's a good solution. I'll go numb because it's, it's better to be numb than to face the emptiness and pain and longing in my soul for something more, for something better. It was only 10 years ago, my dear friends, that I was sitting in that crowd at Steubenville East Conference. For the first time in my life, I had not gone to church. I, I rarely went to church. I went to a public high school. I knew jack squat about faith and God. And, and to be frank with you, I was kind of freaked out. Like Friday night, people were praising and stuff. I was like, what, where am I? What is going on? I was freaked out. If any of you feel that way, I'm praying for you. I've been praying for you for months and months and months. And God has something for you. I was that person. I was so dead. I was sitting in the crowd like a dead man in a tomb. I was sitting in the crowd, like Mark said last night, like a zombie. Like you could look into my eyes and it was just nothing. Void. I was in a lot of sin in high school. I was in a lot of sin. Um, I started to party at a young age, um, underage drinking, got into like just stupid trouble and just being like breaking the rules, right? I was obsessed with popularity. I was obsessed with like the click and the gossip and all that. I danced for 15 years. I identified myself in that, not as a daughter of God, but in what I did. I had a boyfriend that I was impure with. No one told me that there was another way. I didn't know. See, what sin is, sin is a desperate attempt to find Jesus. Every time you sin, you're looking for Jesus. Every time I took a drink as a 14-year-old, I was looking for an escape. I was looking to be accepted. I was looking for fun, for joy. Every time I went to hook up with my boyfriend, I was looking to be fought for, to be seen, to be loved. 
I was looking for Jesus. And I was going to the wrong things, to the things that would deaden me. Because what does sin do? It deadens you. You become less human because we're supposed to be, we're called to be fully alive. You become less human and you become more like a zombie. I love that image that Mark used last night. That was me in high school, like a zombie, just trying to follow the crowd, just trying to go with the flow. Every time you sin, you're, you're searching for the one who will satisfy your longings. Sin is, is missing the mark. That's what it means, to miss the mark. So your mark is Jesus Christ. We're all of our marks. Whether you know it or not, whether you don't even believe in God, your mark is Jesus Christ because that's who we're created for. And when you sin, you're missing it. And I just kept missing it in high school. I kept missing it. And you know what? I became more numb. I became more dead. I kept putting on the mask and the layer and the wall. And I figured if I kept putting on those masks and those layers and those walls, maybe one day I'll feel something inside of me come alive. But it wasn't working. It actually wasn't working. When I sat here 10 years ago and my heart was pierced for the first time and I, 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 was a, I, I started to open up my heart and realize, oh my gosh, maybe I've been doing this all wrong. Maybe what this world is telling me is, is, not, is deceitful, is not going to fill my heart. I was afraid. I was so afraid. I was afraid to let go of that life. I was afraid to walk away because I knew nothing else. I knew nothing else other than the tomb I had been dead in my whole life. But it was comfortable, and I was cool with it. And I knew that in that moment, I remember having a very profound realization that, um, you know, I had been more concerned about, like, myself, like an obsession with myself and my boyfriend. And, like, even, like, this is going to sound silly, but, like, celebrities, right? I wanted to distract myself from what was happening in me to what the world, what's going on in the world. We're called, we're meant to worship. We are meant to worship. That's what we're created for, to worship. But what does the devil do? He wants you to worship false idols. He wants you to worship yourself. He wants you to worship your boyfriend or your girlfriend. He wants you to be more obsessed with what's going on in Taylor Swift's life than in your own. Jesus set me free when I came to this conference. He set me free. And I want to tell you how he did that. But before I do, I think I need to read this passage from Scripture in order to explain to you how he did this to me. Okay, this is from John chapter 11. Um, I'm not going to... You know, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to give you a little, a little background on what's going on, okay? Uh, Jesus is really good friends with these three people, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He's like tight. They're, they're biffles, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How nice is that, right? Hey, Martha, what are you doing this Saturday? Oh, you know, just eating lunch with the Messiah, NBD. Um, <laughs> they were like best friends with Jesus, kind of cool. Um, so Mary and Martha sent for Jesus when their brother Lazarus became very ill. And they were like, dude, you, you need to come. Jesus, you need to come because we have faith that you are going to heal our brother. We have faith that if you come, he will not die. Jesus purposely did not go right away. He knew that he was sick, but he said, he said to his apostles, that it is for the glory of God that he is not going because he wants to be glorified. Jesus, I, he says, I want to be glorified through my Father. This will not end in death. This will not end in death. He gets there and Lazarus is dead. So people are thinking he's crazy. They're like, he, it is ending in death. He is dead. Where were you? Martha runs up to him. Jesus, where the heck were you? If you had come, like I asked you to come, my brother wouldn't have died. She's weeping. Mary's weeping. 
A lot of friends and family and the Jews are weeping with them. This is a very sorrowful time. Jesus, where are you? I'm, this is a little off subject, but I want to just touch upon this for just a second. If you have been there, if you have prayed that prayer, I know what that prayer feels like. I understand that ache. Where are you? What are you doing? I don't understand you right now. It is always, always, always for the glory of God. He is never going to leave you. He will never abandon you. He's got your back. It's always for his glory. But we don't see that sometimes because we have a narrow vision. And that's okay. God understands sometimes, you know. We only see what's right in front of us. But he sees the bigger picture. And he knew. He was like, Martha, I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise your brother. He didn't really say it like that. Or maybe even for those people out there, if there's a God, where is he? If there's a God, where is he? And I remember kind of feeling like, like that too at this conference. Jesus? Really? Who's Jesus anyway? I haven't heard about Jesus since my first communion. What's he going to do? Is he really going to satisfy the desires of my heart? Is he, with everything that I'm looking for in sin, he's going to give me that? Is Jesus really the longing that I seek? Is he really the happiness that I desire? He knows that prayer. He's not afraid of that prayer. Be real with him. Be honest with him wherever you're at. So they're pleading with him. They're, they're giving these prayers to him. What the heck are you doing? Then Mary goes up to him and she says the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laying upon it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for, it has been de for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said to the Father, I thank you, for you have heard me. I know that you hear me always, but I have said on this account of the people standing by that you may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with bandages, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. <laughs> Lazarus had been in a tomb for four days, wrapped up in cloth, already dead, for four days. Jesus called him out of the tomb. Can you imagine for just a second what the people standing by were thinking. Can you imagine what Lazarus was thinking? Uh, Jesus? <laughs> Am I dead? <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand what's going on. Um, can you just imagine for a second what people were thinking around or, uh, that, that had witnessed this? He raised him from the dead. He thanked his father in time of sorrow. People were probably like, why are you thanking God? This is an awful time. My brother has died. Don't you see that? And here you are thanking your father in heaven. He thanks his father, and then Lazarus comes out. He's like, peace out. My work's here done, right? Just kidding. He didn't say peace out. Um, <laughs> Jesus never says peace out, okay? He never leaves us, so he never peaces out. And he's, he's always saying peace in, maybe. Peace in, not peace out. Peace is with you, always with you. Anyway, okay, I'm digging myself into a hole as I go. Um, Jesus knows where you're at. He knows where you're dead. Nothing is beyond him. Not even a rotting corpse is beyond Jesus. No matter what you have done, 
no matter what you have been through, no matter if you have been to this conference five times and you keep going back to the same sin, no matter if you've been in darkness and in a tomb your whole life, no matter what you have done, you are not beyond Jesus. You are not beyond him. And you know what he's doing? We all have tombs. Where's your tomb? You know what he's doing outside of your tomb? He's weeping. He is weeping. He hates your death. He hates your death because he came that you might have life, not death. He doesn't want your death and he has compassion. He's a compassionate father. He's gentle. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus and he saw his sisters, Mary and Martha, weeping and he was moved to pity and compassion because he has a compassionate heart and he is waiting for you outside of your tomb. Oh, but Lord, don't come in here. There's an odor. It stinks. It's nasty. You don't want to come inside of here. You don't know. You're perfect. I'm a mess. <laughs> Mark Hart last night at dinner, oh, you know, just casual conversation, was like, can you imagine what Lazarus' breath must have smelled like? <laughs> it's like, that's a great reflection. I'm going to pray about that. Um, you don't want to come into this. Has anyone seen Les Mis? Awesome. Awesome. Unbelievable movie. Unbelievable. If you ever, man, I weep like a baby every time I watch that movie. At the end, if you haven't seen it, the, the Christ figure in the movie, Jean Valjean, takes a nearly dead man, nearly dead. I mean, he could have left him because they were gonna, they were going after Jean Valjean. He could have left the dead man behind, Marius. But he took Marius over his shoulder and he went through the sewers of France to get him free. He knew that at the end of that sewer, there was, there was authentic love awaiting him. Jean Valjean's daughter. Jesus wants us to be authentically in love. He wants us to be authentically in love. And he has traveled through the sewers, through our crap. He's not afraid of your odor. He's not afraid of your darkness. He descended into hell. Jesus Christ, the perfect being, I thought he would be behind me. He's not, a, oh, he's right there, hi. Um, <laughs> he descended into the darkest place, hell. And what does he do after he descends into hell? He ascends into heaven to bring glory and freedom, and that is what we're called to. He's just, he was waiting. He will descend into your darkness, let him in. Let him in, where is your tomb? Where are you lying? Where are you dead inside? Jesus is waiting. He is not afraid of you. He has spent his entire ministry healing. He's obsessed with your healing. He's obsessed with your wholeness. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to be free. He's desperate for you to do that. What brought me out of my tomb, and we touched upon this um, last night a few times, what brought me out of my tomb were the sacraments. Confession. I hadn't been to confession in eight years since my first communion when I sat in these chairs. And when, I, when people like on Friday night were starting to like talk about confession, I was freaking out. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, you want me to go talk to some like old guy about my sins? Oh gosh, I'm priest, I'm not generalizing that you're old. And if you are old, it's okay. Once again, I'm digging myself into a hole. Jeez, Louise, Lord, save me. Um, but no, really, though, I'm just being honest with you. I'm just being sincere. Like, that's what I thought. I didn't know. I didn't know. What's he going to know? Confession is when Jesus is calling you out of the tomb. And he is waiting to unbind you and set you free. I had been carrying, give it up for confession. 
Confession is awesome. I had been carrying for so many years this darkness and this sin, these masks and these layers. And I was, like I said, I was on a desperate search for Jesus, but I just didn't know where he was. And I thought what the culture was telling me was good and what the culture was telling me would fill my soul really would work, and it didn't. So when I sat in that chair and I knew he was calling me out and I was sitting in the darkness and I was thinking like, like Lazarus, Jesus, really? I'm freaking out. Is that you calling me out there? Is that you? You want to bring me into light? Confession is when Jesus says, come out of your tomb and be set free. Be set free. And, and the first time I went, the first time in eight years, I had someone helping me through. So if you don't know what you're doing, ask someone, ask your youth leader, ask, um, ask me if you want. I don't know. I'll be around, I think. But anyone that, that you feel called to ask to help you through, um, don't tell them your sins. Please don't do that. But um, just to guide you how to be open and, and to bear your heart to this person who is standing in for Jesus Christ. He's standing in the person of Jesus. Jesus Christ. When I went, I had a very, very incredible experience. Um, now, every time you go to confession, you're not going to have these warm, fuzzy feelings. Don't expect that. Own the fact that you're receiving the grace. Own the fact that you are being unbound. Own it. You might not feel it all the time, but th for me, the first time I went back in eight years, I came out like, like skipping. Like I, I was like, crying and singing and skipping like a little kid. And you know what? I'm still skipping like a little kid. I'm still dancing like a little kid. I'm, st I'm like at this party and I want you to come. I want you to come to the party because we're meant to, to party. Jesus partied, right? But we think that the, the parties that, you know, underage drinking and like maybe even like getting into drugs and stuff like that or whatever, whatever you might experience or be pressured with is actually the solution. No, I'm experiencing this freedom. And I know when I'm tempted to go back into the tomb, Jesus says to me, do not go back into that tomb. Do not go back into that tomb. Do not go back into that place of sin. Do not go into your bedroom at night by yourself with your iPhone and lock the door. Don't lay on the couch with your boyfriend when no one's at home. Don't think that maybe if I take this one drink, I'll be fine. It's, it's no big deal. I'll be accepted. Well, maybe someone will accept me then. Don't think that you have to throw your food up to, to find some kind of identity as a daughter or son of God. Don't go back into that tomb. Go to confession. Go to confession. In your time of need, call your priest up. I need to go to confession. It's Tuesday. I know, I know confession's offered on Saturday, but I need to go. If he doesn't want it, call the next priest. Go to confession. Receive also the body and blood of Jesus Christ as often as you can. Yes, we're called to go weekly. But if you can go more times throughout the week, if Jesus Christ, through his words, can raise a dead man, if Jesus Christ, with his spit, can heal a deaf man, a mute man, that's another story in scripture, I'm not just making that up, okay, what can he do with his body and blood? What can he do to you? How will he set you free? You have no idea the journey you're about to go on. The best decision I made was giving my life to Jesus Christ. The best decision I've ever made. Every day, every day I make that decision. Every single day. And Jesus, and I know there are times of, of fear there are times of um, unsurety, and I, I remember having that where Jesus, I'm scared. I'm scared. I have so many questions. I doubt you. I, I, I don't know if I'm worthy of this. I, I, don't know, I don't know how to live this life. He's not scared of you. He's not scared of you. He will not hurt you. He will not force himself upon you. He is gentle. He is meek. He is powerful. But he will not take from you. Our, our Pope Emeritus, Pope Benedict said, dear young people, do not be afraid of Christ, for he takes away nothing and he gives everything. He gives everything. <laughs>